everybody and welcome to the round 1400 participants that we have on already this evening from all over Australia and possibly overseas. Um, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We pay respect to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. I'm Mary Emilaeus and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Um, I have a background in general practice and psychotherapy and I am now training as a psychiatrist. I um, have been based in North Queensland for all, almost all of my um, professional career uh, and have also enjoyed being a medical educator for rural GPs. So I'm particularly um, pleased to see so many people from rural and regional centres. I'd like to also introduce the webinar host for tonight. So this is a collaborative partnership between Project AIR, Strategy for Personality Disorders, and the MHPN. So we have um, engaged in a partnership to plan, produce, and deliver this webinar around NPD. And if you would like more information about assessing, treating, and or living with a personality disorder, go to the Project AIR Strategy for Personality Dis Disorders website which is projectairstrategy.org. Now, this is a good point to draw your attention to the resource box. In the bottom of the screen, there's a little um, file icon and in there will be the resources relevant to this webinar. I'd like to introduce our um, panelists for this evening. So uh, we have a bit of an East Coast panel tonight. First of all, I'd like to welcome Monica Moore, who's representing general practice on our webinar this evening. Now, Monica, you're based in Sydney and I can see that you've um, been involved with the Mental Health Professionals Network. I think it must be pretty much since it started. Could mm. you just tell us a tiny bit about that? Yes, yes. So when it started, um, you know, GPs who had a special interest in mental health, of which I'm one, I've been interested in mental health since um, I had some CBT training in 1996, so we were invited to um, run some groups and um, our area was quite successful and so we've just kept it going since then. Um, and so we have monthly meetings. Um, we have 41 people enrolled for tomorrow, tomorrow night's meeting, so it's, it's quite a, a popular activity and, and a very helpful one um, across the, the different disciplines. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you, Monica, and it's great having you on the national um, panel for the webinar tonight. Now, I'd like to welcome um, Andrew Staniforth, who's a clinical psychologist. Now, and Andrew, you're in Canberra, and I noticed that you have quite an involvement with um, working at the university and also some teaching. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about the kinds of things you do with ANU? Yes, yeah, so I've been at the ANU for a couple of years in my current role, which is at the Counselling Centre, and so I have number of roles, counselling students that are studying here and seeking help for various things that provide supervision to clinical psych registrars as well as within the team. And for the last uh, more than five years, I've taught into the clinical psychology program at ANU as well as a casual lecturer. Thank you. And um, it's great to have you on the panel tonight. And I know you have a particular interest in working with clients who have long-term kinds of problems like personality disorder. Great to have your expertise. Thanks, and um, Tom O'Brien, he's a social worker and psychotherapist from Brisbane. Now, Tom, I, I'm just going to declare here that Tom has also been a teacher of mine uh, in my master's degree in psychotherapy a long time ago. And it's a pleasure to work together on this panel. Now, Tom, I noticed that you have 32 years in private practice. Do you want to comment on that? Fine. But it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting time. I mean, I, and just in narcissistic personality disorder, it's almost one of the places that you do deal with people uh, with narcissistic personality. And, uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's been one that's given me a great deal of uh, learning as well as uh, significant moments of pain, but uh, I I've enjoyed it. 
and I, and I'm sure that um, the people that have come to see you over the years have greatly valued it too. It's it's one of the lovely things about these MHPN webinars is that the panels often have such a diverse group of clinicians, and um, we have people from the public sector, the private sector, NGOs. So I'm sure the audience um, really appreciate your experience and um, everyone on the panel. I just wanted to mention tonight we're using a slightly new space, which has been the case since February. So there's currently 1,600 people um, in the participant room. So we've, uh, because we've had such high numbers, so we had 4,000 people register for tonight, which is amazing, and um, about 350 people are currently using the chat box. So there's some improvements that have been made to the platform. Uh, it has the same functions as before, but it just looks a little bit different. So if you would like to use the chat box, there's an open chat tab at the bottom of your screen and the, cha the chat box will then open on a separate tab. I've mentioned the resources down in the bottom right-hand corner there. And if you have any problems that are technical in nature, you'll see there there's a tab that says uh, technical support and you can um, click on that for frequently asked uh, questions and also if you need technical support. Now, um, you have also received the case study in advance, the predisposing activities, uh, and the ground rules have been disseminated beforehand. Essentially, just remember that this is a public forum, so things you type in the chat box can be seen by hundreds of people, and then on the webinar library in the future, people who record it, actually, I'm not sure if they see the chat, but anyway. Don't put anything in writing that you wouldn't want on the front page of the paper. Um, now, each panellist is going to give a short response to Gary's story and then followed by questions and answers between the panel and between the panel and the audience. And we have registered the questions that you um, put in at registration and we will make sure that those get acknowledged. But the learning outcomes, just to remind you, is we're going to be looking at the prevalence distinguishing features of and prognosis for NPD, including its impact on families and carers, looking at some evidence-based approaches that are most effective, and to, to look at how different disciplines, as well as families and carers, contribute to supporting and managing people with narcissistic personality disorder. Now, um, I certainly had some of my own responses to Gary's story, and I thought about if I met Gary as a psychotherapist where I had maybe 50 minutes for the initial conversation um, and then the difference between where I might meet Gary as a general practitioner for the first time, maybe there's 10 minutes and five people in the waiting room and I had different responses. So I'm sure all of you, um, and some of them weren't very polite to be honest, so I'm really interested to hear how the, um, the panellists respond. So first of all, I'm going to invite... Um, invite you, Monica, to have a look at um, how you might think about Gary when you met him. Thanks. Thank you. And, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the webinar. Um, I must admit, when I saw this case, I, I was thinking about how could I have got that much history in one consultation and I think it's because I would have ended up extending the consultation and felt a bit steamrolled, which is not unusual. And that's part of the, the diagnostic process. Um, and I suppose if I think about the, the red flags, like the, the things in the consultation that make me think that perhaps this person has a narcissistic personality disorder, is that concept where everyone else is less than me, you know, he's, he's better than everyone else and he doesn't have a problem. Um, and that, you know, if I've talked to Jesse later, you know, that he's charming and romantic and then he's changed when the baby's born and, and doesn't get enough attention. And there are multiple problem areas um, with substance use, with alcohol, with his employment, his wife, with his child, family of origin and friends. And just the gut feeling that I would have had of being steamrolled, feeling devalued and irritated and, and just a bit bored with his story of, of, you know, how good he is and how everything is just not good enough for him. So as I was thinking about it in general practice, about how I might want to behave, this is the aim, is, is once I sort of get that sense in me is to just try and hold my patience and be really interested in the, to the person inside to see what it is that he needs and just let those grandiose statements pass unchallenged. 
and you know his complaint about the receptionist just saying oh of course you know receptionists are people too we all have our off days and just normalizing that being good enough um, and then perhaps making a decision to model some good boundaries myself and um, talking about good self-care you know that validating that it's good that he's here um, that looking after himself is really important um, that I'd like to be able to help with that I'd introduce you know the concept of stress management is clearly under a lot of stress if nothing in his life is not going according to how he'd been hoping and would you like to go and see a psychologist that can be very helpful I know that your boss has told you you've got to do something but for yourself you know you would do this for yourself um, and being curious about um, alcohol use and and gently expressing my concern on himself. Maybe, you know, some people use it to self-medicate, just being a little bit gentle and, and curious about it. Um, and that if I really focus on his physical health care, it might be a way of getting him back perhaps for some blood tests and, and engaging him um, and, and definitely making sure that when he comes back, I would book a longer appointment. Um, and then if he, you know, in ongoing appointments, um, hopefully building up a relationship with him where I could gently guide him back to what he actually needs because you know he might want to talk about other people and how other people this and other people that and allowing him to to say it and he feels heard and then say but what can we do for you in, in this consultation um, and trying to avoid that special treatment that sometimes they want you know the bulk billing the longer appointments the contact in between um, appointments and just being aware that um, at the moment he's he's quite unsupported in terms of his social network. Um, he has got a wife, but she's expressing some degree of concern about you know the relationship, and she's going to see her own um, psychologist. And it may well be that the relationship may not survive. And so, um, people with narcissistic narcissistic personality disorder actually have a high risk of suicide. So it's important to be you know, gently curious and to screen for it regularly. And in terms of, you know, in my situation as a GP, because I, I do do psychotherapy, but when I'm thinking of the general practice sort of setting, just remembering that inner patience and when he complains about my treatment and how I'm not good enough and I'm not doing it well enough and where was I trained, not to take it personally and keeping a sense of humour and really discussing the case with peers and with a, a supervisor is a really good idea. Um, you know, it, it's something that keeps us on a focus and um, an acceptance that sometimes they will come to the GP for a long time before they'll engage with um, a clinician who's going to help them. And often it's only after a major loss, like a divorce or they lose their job or something like that, that they will actually engage. And um, you know, so so in terms of of, um, of what um, I would you know recommend, I think a sense of humour and patience and and supervision and peer support. Th these are the things that um, that I think in general practice I found helpful when when this was happening. So those are the ideas that I've had, and it's a complex case. It's quite difficult. So I'm keen Thanks, to hear Monica. what the others have to say. I think you're a very patient GP because I must admit I read the story and I thought. Maybe Gary could see another GP. <laughs> anyway, um, so now um, it has been pointed out, and it's very appropriate at this moment, that um, actually there's many people in the MHPN, and under the Medicare system there are a number of different clinicians that we can refer to, including mental health social workers. And um, in my referral network in Cairns, I refer a lot to people like mental health social workers, and I have... Um, the option of some mental health nurses also through ATAP. So it's important to remember that um, lots of the counselling uh, and psychotherapy clinicians um, are not only social workers. And um, so on that note, I'd like to introduce Tom to um, talk about how he might respond to Gary. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> Working with Gary and his world is, you know, a, a complex art. Uh, he, it's a difficult presentation. It's not one that's very. That his motivation, I think, is quite questionable. It it doesn't seem to come from him. It's a relatively external uh, one. His work situation is vulnerable. Uh, he's had a long um, history with the firm, but um, 
you know, hasn't able, been able to uh, rise from a base level. Uh, there is, I think, significant vulnerability within the family context. Um, uh, he's got a serious alcohol problem. I mean, that amount of drinking is such that I think, um, you know, it's certainly one of the uh, major priorities and makes him increasingly vulnerable. We don't know much about his personal history. Uh, some brief notes, um, but we did see uh, a, a pattern of him feeling that he was lesser and treated as lesser than his brother, who I think is a significant player in this world. Um, I think she clearly has more motivation, um, but I, I think uh, that's still to be tested. I thought that there was real concern about safety. I wondered about what her understanding of uh, her own safety was, but I thought that uh, there was enough signs from Gary, about Gary, that uh, especially if there was some breakdown in his work or breakdown in the family uh, or even the threat of breakdown in the family, that sense that he felt that his, um, his wife was really uh, focusing mostly on the uh, child and uh, leaving him feeling vulnerable. I, I, I would be concerned, or well, I'd want to investigate further uh, about any safety risks um, that there may be uh, from Gary towards um, uh, other members of his family and perhaps uh, towards himself. Uh, I think the, the boss, uh, uh, his work situation is one that we would need to investigate. I think it would be a key part of stability for Gary. Okay. Now, how do we start to think about what's going on? Well, I, I thought the three major issues were a serious alcohol problem um, that will be will be limiting his functioning at present, uh, has the risk of getting worse, and uh, alcohol um, may uh, uh, complicate his response to any further problems. He's got significant narcissistic function, functioning. He's arrogant, contemptuous, uh, and he really has had limited achievement. Um, but his presentation on just the words is of um, um, uh, looking down on everyone. Uh, and I am concerned about safety for Gary and his family. So what do we do and who does what? I think in these problem, in this kind of presentation, I think there is a question, which comes first? Do we uh, start to look at uh, doing something, encouraging Gary to pay attention to his alcohol use and perhaps look for some kind of uh, uh, treatment or support in that area? Do we attempt to take on the very big task, but the central task of his uh, narcissistic relationship with the world, or uh, and or all the time, of course, but, you know, is it such that it comes first, um, the safety for Jesse and the, uh, his child? So who does what and when? Uh, you know, I, by timing, I mean... You know, which do we attend to first? I, I think it's a really open question. Uh, the, the second is, where who, who does this task? What is the role of the, uh, uh, the split between some specialist role attempting to treat either or both the alcohol or the uh, narcissistic personality 
um, or the role for a, uh, a general practitioner. And I see a very key role for a general practitioner. And I really liked what Monica was saying. I think that, that I suspect that a focus on health might be uh, a way to get into Gary's world. And then uh, a mental health clinician, and as um, Mary was saying, what, what kind of mental health clinician? Okay, how to work with him. Well, in the end, I think relationship is the main thing that we can influence. We know that. The research is in. It's very clear that uh, relationship is key in all forms of uh, uh, mental health practice, uh, especially in any kind of uh, psychotherapy. Uh, but how... Do we do that with someone like Gary? I've uh, using the work of uh, Rosenfeld. Uh, I've uh, think of Gary as a thin-skinned narcissist in contrast to uh, a more uh, thick-skinned um, who person who is um, um, you know just has no sense of their impact on other people uh, and with um, a, a sort of who, who needs a fairly robust engagement with them to try and get through that hard shell. I think Gary is very thin-skinned and very sense, hypersensitive, um, and any engagement you need to have to be very careful not to uh, have Gary feel humiliated. Uh, and the final thing is keep working no matter what happens. Uh, and I think uh, Monica was onto that. You know, if he starts to dis you in terms of your capacity or your uh, training or any other characteristic or whether you're bald, uh, whatever it is, you, you need to somehow keep engaging with Gary. What is happening? Why is he talking like this now rather than um, kind of respond with some kind of limit setting? Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Mary. Um, now it's really um, one of one of the things I always enjoy is people submit their questions in advance, and it's interesting how often the questions get answered in the presentations um, by the, the different disciplines. And I know that someone had particularly asked about that spectrum and the, the thin skin versus the really grandiose narcissist, and I think you um, explained that really beautifully. And I'd now like to um, welcome in Andrew to talk about um, Gary from. A psychologist perspective. Thanks, Andrew. Yes, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this tonight. The GP, I think, has just done a wonderful do job to initially engage Gary, and the beginning of the vignette really helps us know that there is a bit of leverage, I think, that the GP can use to try and get the to Gary in with the psychologist as it's deemed necessary for his return to work. So I think it could be really pivotal for both him and his family that really the GP is able to help that move that way. So the first point that I want to make is that Gary, when Gary presents for therapy with us, the psychologist or other mental health clinician, it's likely he'll be assessing us as well as us assessing him. We already know he has high expectations about what he wants from us and that he believes he's more likely to encounter incompetence than not. I'd expect that alongside hearing about the presenting issues, I may be challenged at various points in the first appointment and beyond that too. I believe our response is really important here. Ideally, we want to be open and curious to what is said or implied and demonstrate our ongoing focus on the client, on Gary. If Gary did this, if he was challenging, I probably would attempt initially, for maybe quite a while depending on how it goes, to sidestep the challenge and instead attempt to open up the discussion to explore the comment is reflecting something else that might be going on somewhere else in his life, such as at work. Our initial focus and the more important task, I think, is to develop the working therapeutic relationship and our shared understanding of the presenting issue. The emerging personality information I would take as information that I'll observe and gather as I get to know him a bit better. And as with any new client, developing a clear understanding of the presenting issues is really important. We know from the vignette some information. We've got an idea of the picture of what he's coming in. 
course, there's going to be much more detail. So we understand that there's stresses at work, change at family with his new baby. We want to understand these things more. I'd also initially explore alcohol as how he's using it to cope, what he might be thinking around his alcohol use, but I guess I'd just kind of continue to flag that but maybe not dive into it too much. It is vital our initial approach to choose direct challenge and verges much closer to a curious stance that demonstrates our ongoing genuine interest in the reported experience, Gary, as well as our emerging experience in the room. As a GP is already, it is vital we create an experience with Gary that is likely to buttress the emerging collaborative therapeutic alliance. We want to hear him talk to the situations that are him and continue to be strongly empathically present, validating of his experience and genuinely open to collaborative exchange that focused on his goal returning to work. For a moment with the referral, I want to imagine we don't know that narcissism is a presenting issue and from my experience, this is probably more likely. Rather, I would expect to find other factors like relationship trouble with his wife after the birth of the baby, ongoing disputes, increased drinking, conflict, interpersonal things at work or perceived bullying alongside things to do with risk. And as I indicated earlier, the primary focus is the development of the relationship and assessing those initial presenting issues. The other areas we may want to assess, like developmental history, will need to wait because we must be finely attuned to his emerging presentation in the room and being really curious about what that is. The experience I'm referring to in regard to the my emerging experience in the room is that I'm attuned to where what's going on in me, my counter-transference, as that could be the first key as to how I'm encountering a narcissistic presentation. So without the referral in this, yeah, this is the experience to which I would be open to listening to. I mentioned at the start he would be assessing us. I would be open to his comments and meet them with curiosity and interest. I would want him to tell me about his comments as best he can. Here we can build our shared understanding and the unspoken experience, what's emerging in me and perhaps in him too, will also develop. Hopefully he'll likely begin to show us his character as it's experienced by others and how this impacts upon him. The advantage we have in this vignette is we get a sense of who Gary is now, but we also have some reported history which enables us to develop empathy towards him. It might be easy for me to say, but being empathically present with someone with a narcissistic personality disorder or any other personality disorder can be challenging. And so for treatment, a primary challenge is keeping someone with an NPD presentation in treatment. That's our first goal. We want to keep them there so they keep coming in and we form our relationship. Then we can start to understand the maladaptive coping mechanisms that are used. The steadiness and consistency in which we can orientate and respond to Gary, Gary is likely to be fundamental in both our ability to sustain a working relationship and focus on helping Gary with his experience. And over time in therapy, with a consistent empathic connection has been formed, some of those narcissistic defences might become more permeable and then create an opportunity for us to explore them. But it's unlikely Gary will show any sign of vulnerability early we need to do this through establishing a very strong, empathic relationship that is focused on understanding him and to help Gary understand himself. Thanks, Andrew. I um, yeah, it's it's uh, really interesting what you're talking there about the dual assessment, and and it does feel like that sometimes you immediately feel as a clinician that you're under the microscope yourself. And it can be quite hard, quite an unpleasant place to sit. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to explore all of these issues. What I'd like to do now is just move on to our um, audience poll. So a number of... Now, first of all, I would like to say there are around nearly 1,800 people online, which is wonderful. And I hope you're enjoying talking to each other in the chat box as well. Remember, it's there if you'd like to. Now, people submitted some questions, about 350 people put in questions at the beginning. So there are a number of points there on the screen. What we're going to do is poll the audience and give you the opportunity to say which of these things you really want to address in the panel discussion. Now, it is very organic, so I can't make any promises, but um, we would be really interested to see what this particular audience um, would like to focus on tonight. 
So I wonder, Redback, if you could activate that poll for us, please, and we'll give the audience around 30 seconds to respond. So... Hopefully people are getting the opportunity. Not seeing any numbers yet, Redback. I wonder if it's... Um... Oh, yeah. No. Let me know if I should just keep it open. Yes, great. Okay, so there's a people quick off the mark there. Um, we'll just have about another 15 seconds. You've still got time. So about 300 of you have responded so far. 900, the numbers are going up. That's about half. If anyone else wants to, you've got about 10 seconds left. We're looking forward to seeing where we go. Okay, we might close it there. Thanks very much, Redback. So I'll just run through the results there. So the, um, the theme that people most want to talk about and I must admit, I'm not surprised, is the transference and counter-transference. This is the hardest thing um, working with narcissistic personality disorder. And then the next question is around engagement. So how do you actually engage with someone? How do they even come to therapy? Um, and then we're pretty close there around um, the overlap or the differences and similarities with other personality disorders. And then... Um, narcissism's relationship with things like ego, age, personality, mental health, other diagnoses. So I think that just helps to inform the panel when you're answering your questions that we're particularly interested in the, um, the transference issues and the engagement issues, and no doubt we'll cover some of the other as well. So thanks very much for that uh, red bike, and we might go on to the discussion. So um, I think, first of all, I, there's been some interesting questions in the chat box around formal diagnosis and perhaps it's tangentially related to engagement. So um, I might go to Andrew. Um, if, if Gary did come back a few times, at what point, if ever, do you think it would be helpful to say to him, Gary, you meet the diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder? Can you comment on that? I think it's a great question and a conundrum I've faced before as well. I don't, I'm going to play down the middle, I don't think there is a right way to answer that question. I think it really depends on what you're forming with that client. And I might err towards letting him know what I'm thinking or letting a client know what I'm thinking if we've already started to establish a discussion around grandiosity, self-esteem, interpersonal wounding, emotion dysregulation and how they might try to manage that in the way they interact with others. If none of those things were coming up, I wouldn't probably be going near it. I'd also probably not really want to go near it too early in our treatment because I, I think it probably will just create another barrier or, or even a whole other thing to debate and argue. And I think that's going to keep moving us away from the client's experience or Gary's experience in Thanks, Andrew. And Monica, I'd, I'd like you to um, perhaps respond to the same thing. So sometimes when you're a GP, you might have a sense that this is what's going on uh, and you're trying to encourage someone to seek some psychological support. Would diagnosis be part of that and, and what other ways might be effective to encourage someone like Gary to seek psychological support? Um, I, I have never found, um, I mean, I, I've never done it. I've never said to someone, I think you have narcissistic personality disorder and you should go and see someone about it. Um, because in my imagination, that would be uh, just something that would make them feel so wounded and so got at. Um, and I don't know that it would be a positive thing. My encouragement about him going to um, get psychological help would centre more around the issues that he's presenting with that would motivate him. Um, and so within that context, I would hope that down the track, um, you know, if it's helpful... I mean, sometimes people look it up and then they come in and they say, do you think I have this disorder? Um, in which case I'll go, well, what do you think? 
um, and what makes you say that? And if if it was true that you did, what would you do about it? That would be as far as I'd go. I don't. I, w- I would never diagnose someone with with a narcissistic personality disorder because I don't think it would be helpful. Just out of curiosity, Monica, do you think is that specific to narcissistic personality disorder? Because there might be other kinds of personality disorders where uh, people find it helpful. I just I wonder about that. Yeah, I, I think it's true. I mean, it, it depends. I, I think sometimes people with borderline personality disorder, especially now that more information is coming out in terms of it being related to complex developmental trauma, that that might actually be helpful and they'll understand why it is that they have emotional storms and difficulties and, and that might be helpful. But my so far, my understanding of what's available widely of what people know about narcissists is that it's it's a term. It's a really derogative term, derogatory term, and um, I don't know that that would be helpful. It's not. I mean, sometimes when people have ADHD or autism, that's an actually a helpful diagnosis to say, "Look, this is what's happening." I, I, I would feel uncomfortable. Other GPs might have done it and, and feel that it works really well, but I don't know that it would help them to engage um, in getting help for themselves. Thank you very much for that. And I, I think they are their questions where there's no simple answer, which yeah. which we keep saying it's very complex. And Tom, I'd like to invite you to come in, and I I want to think about this question of, you know, let's say Gary does accept the advice from his GP who he currently uh, thinks is very competent uh, and comes to see you, um, and Being an experienced clinician, he's not going to walk in the door and say, I've got narcissistic personality disorder, but you're probably going to feel that quite quickly. So I just want to talk about what it's like as a clinician, uh, how you can be in the room with someone. I mean, I just found reading the case study about Gary, the things that he said, really confronting, and he wasn't even a person in the room with me. How do you... um, yeah, look, it, with it, it is complex. And I, I'm just bringing to mind someone that I saw just seen the last week or two that who, you know, was saying sort of quite ridiculous or repulsive almost things, not not anything that was, you know, uh, stomach-churningly repulsive, but that kind of arrogant way of dealing with the world and I, I felt it quite strongly, and I thought, oh, this is, you know, where's this going to go? Um, but I just managed to just wait a little and go, I wonder what's going on for this person. Why are they talking like that? What's, what needs to be happening for you? What's your experience of the world that you see it this way? Um, and with Gary, uh, I mean, you know, I really run the company. I'm the only one who knows what's going on. And yet I'm in a base grade job and have been in in the same or similar, I think, base grade job for 10 years. There's, that's just an inherent conflict that, that um, anybody with any degree of uh, intelligence could understand is a problem. And yet something prevents him from using his intelligence to recognize that there's something wrong with that story. So why does he, why does he think like that? What's, why is it so important to him that he thinks he is a superstar, that he is knowledgeable where everyone else is lacking? Um, you know... Uh, it doesn't take uh, um, a you know psychological genius to suggest that it's related to feeling that he hasn't got those things. So how does he deal with not having and knowing somehow that he hasn't got those capacities that he claims and feeling that he has to proclaim to the world that he is you know, a central figure, a significant business owner the, the, or, or manager, the, you know, the smartest person in the room. I mean, he's, um, 
you know, so that kind of thinking in myself, I think, helps me to see a guy who's struggling. Mm-hmm. And um, Andrew, you know, at the same time as um, as we're able to think about how he might be feeling, we also can feel, you know, denigrated, belittled, not valued, and those feelings can be really hard to sit with. Have you got any tips, you know, because you're talking about making an empathic connection as being really important. So how do you keep an attitude of empathy and openness wow. and curiosity when someone is telling you that you're a fool? Gosh, I, well, I think it is a really difficult thing. As Tom was talking, I was thinking, we're attending to the client, we're attending to our own thoughts about what we want to do about an assessment and attending to our internal experience too and trying to keep all of it in check. And when I sit with people that maybe are provocative and maybe really pushing buttons or being critical or challenging me, I guess I try to orientate to what's going on and be curious about what is happening for them and try to find a way that I could maybe phrase something or say something that could help us understand their internal experience. That's what I want to do while at the same time I think trying to notice if in me something is coming up that makes me angry or upset or like I want to defend myself and just trying to notice that really and watch that and as best I can and of course I don't do this well all the time but as best I can trying to stay steady within myself trying to provide this consistent way of responding which still maintains boundaries but also I guess let some of those things go through to the keeper kind of a different way of saying it. Thanks and um Monica, just coming back to you, I mean, often when you refer a patient to a, a counselling um, professional of some description, um, the patient will come back and report into the GP. Um, so how, how do you, you know, what's your experience about whether, whether people with this level of narcissistic uh, personality disorder actually engage? How many of them actually stick with it? How many of them can tolerate it? What, you know... What have you seen work? What's effective to keep them in therapy? So, so I'm thinking of the, the various people. I'm thinking of this particular woman who who was a, a woman in her 70s and, um, and she actually tried a variety of people and she'd always come back and say, no, that, that one was no good because of this and that was no good because of that. Um, and but my focus was more in managing my own sort of reaction of not losing patience and keeping my sense of humour and and also I would banter, I mean I suppose with, with Gary it might be a little bit more difficult being female to banter with him and that's sort of a little bit, you know, that, that's something to take into account. But to just keep a, a sort of a, a gentle thing, oh well, you know, how about trying it again, you know, because sometimes the first time it doesn't work, but how about going another time and, you know, just being patient with the clinician. Maybe you need to explain what you actually need a little bit more and how they could be helpful. Um, but just also accepting and not arguing, not entering into an argument about, um, you know, how they could sort of do it better. I, I also wonder about the, the, the concept of... Um, really recommending someone, I mean, because sometimes they find someone, this is the best of the best of the best and this is the, you know, the, the really the expert on someone who might be, you know, my condition, which is stress management in a business world. And you go, okay, well, let's, let's see how that goes. And, and to, to allow them to choose the clinician um, based on, on their assessment. And sometimes that's helpful and they will engage with someone merely because they, they feel that this person is a person of authority. So, but it's very variable, and they and they sometimes come back, and you know it wasn't good enough. So you just have to play it by ear. I don't have the answers to that one. I'm sorry. And um, Tom, coming back to you, I mean communication between the different clinicians involved in somebody's care is that important in this kind of situation? Well, it's obviously a central um, issue. <clears throat> you know, no one has got capacity to be across, say, those three central issues that I suggested, you know, the alcohol, the safety issues, and the, 
you know, engaging with, uh, you know, the complex task of trying to uh, help someone negotiate their narcissistic relationship with the world. So uh, no no single person can do all of that. Um, so communication is important. Um, I, I think um, um, you need to be clear to the patient that you are communicating with other people. Um, you don't want to find, you know, for them in, for any particular reason they, that they come across that you are communicating with someone uh, without their knowledge. So I, I'd certainly do that. Um, um, I'd, you know, pitch it as, you know, our concern for, you know, that, that we work together um, to uh, meet their needs. Um, but they're all, you know, it's always going to be on the edge. It's always going to be uh, a risk of breakdown. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think, uh, I think that this story we've been given is a complex one because I think there are urgent issues but at the same time, somewhere in the system, we need to be able to say, "Okay, we'll get there. Don't worry. These are these are these are problems." But I think, as um, Monica said, have another go. Go back. Try again. You know, try and negotiate with work. Try and talk to um, your wife. Try and you know. Keep going, and uh, so how to balance urgency and the need not to have over much pressure on anybody to solve the problem. And and Tom, have you got just with your because you've been a private practitioner for such a long time? What kind of practical tips have you got around communication with people like referring doctors? So you would probably get referrals from psychiatrists and from GPs. Are there any things that that will that work? You know, how do you well, get their well, attention? I mean, I I think relationship again is key. I, I think that um, you know, I know it's difficult in, in busy schedules, but I I like to talk to um, the colleagues that I'm working with, especially uh, in complex. Um, cases like Gary's, um, you know, I think in, when they're relatively straightforward, it probably can be handled by uh, just written communication. But I think some sense that, that uh, you know, because Gary is going to go from practitioner to practitioner dissing everyone else. And, you know, it can be hard, you know, if you're going okay with a Gary, to, to hear him say, oh, the GP's like this, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, oh, you know, I internally, I hope, oh, yeah, GPs can be like that sometimes. Oh, the last, um, the psychologist I saw, he, she was like this. Oh, yeah, well, that can happen, you know. So it's easy to get a sense that, you know, I'm doing okay with this person. So, um, uh, you know, if, if, if the report is that someone else isn't, then maybe that's accurate. Whereas, you know, a, communi a, a verbal communication with the, the uh, uh, a specialist of some kind, whether it's a, a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist or somebody else, um, and um, the general practitioner will, will go a long way to keeping that communication open. And Andrew, um, I wondered whether... I suppose we might move on to thinking about the particularly the sort of um, pointy end safety kind of issues. I mean, sometimes people do become suicidal or you're concerned that their, um, you know, jealousy about their partner is reaching a, a crisis kind of level. Have you had, um, you know, approaches to those? I guess let's start with the suicidal situation. Yeah. So yeah. any experience in that area with 
Yeah, I, I think it's really important, as I've been saying, I think we're all saying, to be consistent and to maintain a clear way of what we're going to do and then following through with action. So I guess with anyone where I assess risk and risk is part of the picture, I would continue to assess, just as Monica was saying, and look at it. And if risk was increasing, I hopefully would have established with someone like Gary the way that we're going to manage that together. So I'm assuming we've been working for a little while, hopefully, and we've got some understanding, but around what my responsibilities will be to him or to his family, and that might be referring to the acute mental health team in the area, definitely with communication with the GP or any other treatment providers. I agree with what Tom was just saying earlier about it's so important really that we're all collaborating, particularly with someone that is complex and challenging for us to stay in the picture. And I think sometimes with some clients, and particularly with people with narcissism at times, they might try to want special treatment or negotiate things. And I think for us, it's so important to have a clear idea of how we're responding to risk and what those acute, in particular, those acute factors are that will compel us to do things and how we then talk about that with the client, regardless of maybe protests or they're challenging of us or getting really upset. I remember a few occasions where that's happened, but I think over time we've been able to repair those ruptures that occur when maybe we do something that they don't like because we start to understand, I guess, the bigger picture. And something I think Tom and Monica were talking about, this, the bigger picture within all these microcosms of what we're trying to do each session as well. Thank you. Um, Monica, did you have anything to add around around that issue of um, risk and in particular when people become suicidal? Any um, tips or reflections? I, yeah, I, I suppose um, just keeping you know, trying to preserve a relationship by saying that, you know, it's my role as your GP to look after you. Um, you know, today you looked really down and I asked you about, um, you know, how you were and, and you said that you were contemplating suicide. So, you know, I'm going to have to ask you these questions and then, you know, we're going to have to establish safety. And so, you know, I'll, I'll take you every step of the way. And if he has engaged with the... A, 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 um, you know, a, a clinician, a psychotherapist or a psychologist um, that I'd say, you know, I have to get in contact with them as well and let them know and, you know, depending on what it is, I mean, you know, I, I'd say, you know, my job is to call an ambulance or my job is to, to do this. So it really would depend. But trying as much as possible to, to engage with them. Um, the other thing is that sometimes as a GP, when they don't get their own way, they, they, they threaten suicide. Um, so... Again, this elderly lady who no one else in the general practice would see, um, they would um, say, you know, Monica, she's wanting a house call straight away in the middle of the session and if you don't go, she says she's got a gun and she's going to kill herself. Um, and so I, I just, you know, I said, okay, you know, in between sessions I'll ring her up and I phoned her and I said, look, I'll miss you. I really miss you if you kill yourself. So how about we organise a home visit for tomorrow? And so that's what I mean about that sort of gentle um, uh, sense of humour but not necessarily giving in to their requests. Now that's something I could do with her because I had relationship with her. It wasn't the first session. Um, and and But it really need, does need to be taken seriously. And I think as a GP, because I'm not limited by the Medicare item numbers, I can sort of just have that contact with her and maybe make a regular appointment to support Gary. You know, let's make a regular appointment, see how you're going, check things like your blood pressure. You know, maybe I could be working around that. But it is a really difficult thing and also domestic violence. I mean, I'm glad that his wife is, is seeing someone because I guess from my point of view, she's having the support she needs there. Um, and uh, I'm not going to have a discussion with him unless... You know, there's, there is evidence of this, in which case I have to say, you know, I, I may have to make a report with that too. Those would be the sorts of things I'd be thinking about and, and then having a discussion with the clinician if they're seeing someone and saying, yeah, what do we do now? Mm. Thanks, Monica. Now, Tom, um, we get, as you have pointed out a few times, this is a very complex case. And one of the issues in here, which I am to some extent springing on you, was that he partly has come because his boss said he had to get some help before he'd have him back at work. Now, what what's your experience about compelling people 
I mean, Monica said, you know, often people like this don't even go near therapy unless there's a, a major narcissistic wound, like a divorce or something. People do get compelled. What's your experience of, of how they... Yeah, my, my, my experience is, I think, that there's always, even if they claim to be frog-marched into the room with, you know, their... Um, uh, one arm being twisted at the back as they walk in. Uh, there's always some percentage of them that is knows that there's a problem. Uh, even if that's 2%, 10%, you're shooting for a bit closer to 40 or 50, but uh, I try and work with that percentage, whatever it is, whether it's 2 or 40 you know, in fact, the person who comes in and says, I'm really keen on help, uh, in reality, they're probably only operating on 40 or 50% willingness to change and have something new happen in their life. Mostly, they just want their problem to go away, um, especially if it can be done without any change on, in them. So I think this kind of person is, in fact, no different from anyone else in that. I, I'm Compulsion, uh, especially as this, this isn't a legal compulsion. It's not uh, a child in um, care of the department or something like that. This is uh, a person whose boss told them to come along and get some help. Well, I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be enough to get me along to see some help unless there was enough in me to say I need something. So that's what I'd be searching for. Andrew's term earlier, curiosity. I'd be trying to get to that space in them. And Tom, on a practical level, is that something you're looking for it, you're observing it, you're estimating it's about 10% or whatever. Is, is, would you observe that to the person themselves? It seems yeah, like there's well, a part I think of I would. that wants to be here. I think I would, definitely. You know, as part of, of saying, you know, where are we going from here? Um you know, after, you know, as the session goes on, the first session or even after a couple of sessions, you know, what what's the, the, there is no compulsion. I'm not in a position to insist that they be here. So in the end, each time anyone sits in a room, sits down, starts talking, they're indicating some kind of, um, some kind of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Now we have 1,800 people in our um, participant room at the moment, which is great. And um, Andrew, I wondered whether you had any um, comments there around um, that sense of compulsion, but then that there's a part of them that does actually want to come. Yeah, I agree with Tom. And I think trying to attune to and then align with that part, even if it's a small part, I would really try to elaborate that with the client. So 2% or 40%. And I would also, just as Tom said, respect that. I would talk about, I know, you know, part of you might be feeling like this and part of you is compelled to be here. I wonder what else is going on. I wonder what you're finding within yourself. How can we still make use of this time and space that we have to see what you want to get out of it? And going back to this vignette, we do have, you know, he thinks he contributes a lot to the company. So could that be a way to help increase his motivation and identify more with there are some internal things that perhaps he could get from being there, particularly if he does want to retain his work. Thank you. And actually, while, while I've still got you, Andrew, I know that um, you actually with Tom at the beginning, but I, I suspect you might have some thoughts on it too around the different, the different sort of spectrum around narcissism. So mm. some people are actually very vulnerable, whereas other people yeah. are very thick-skinned. Yeah. How do you, how do you sense that, and how what different approaches might you have? I, I guess from my experience and from what I've read as well, they might present like that in the room. Like someone might be more aggressive or particularly challenging about qualifications or experience or anything like that, and someone might, I guess, present on the other spectrum 
been more easily wounded. But underneath that, I think both are facades of some pain, internal pain that we really want to find a way to connect with and maybe create some interest in the person, in Gary in this case, getting them to look inside. And so, I mean, like with other presentations, borderline clients can look differently at different times, but there's something going on internally to do with a developmental attachment experience, perhaps. So with depression, it could manifest lots of different ways, but we want to find out what's going on inside for someone. And I'd say the same. The outside is maybe these different defences that can keep people away from them and it keeps them safe but at the same time it keeps them feeling this disconnect and loneliness that they never really have a chance to repair and if we can be steady enough to find a way to persevere through some of those attacks then maybe we can get inside and start to to notice and and attune to and then maybe create some interest in the client to look at that experience themselves. Thank you. And um, Monica, I'd like to bring you in now just thinking about, um, you know, people live with Gary. So he, he lives with Jesse and they have a child who at the moment is a baby and we, we acknowledge that um, Gary's struggling with that because Jesse doesn't have as much time for him anymore and he seems like he's a bit jealous of the attention the baby gets. At some stage, that baby's going to be a teenager. And I just wondered whether... Um, Sometimes, you know, as a GP, you, you see a young person who's distressed and you quickly can ascertain from their story that they actually have a, per, a parent with a personality disorder. Have you, you know, how would you support Jesse's, uh, sorry, Jesse and Gary's child when, you know, he's 14 and, and coming in in distress? Yeah, well, that that's a really common story, and especially because that child will have come in over time um, and... And it depends. I mean, a 14-year-old, um, you know, the, may be developing not just a stress, um, you know, that's manifested in terms of clashing with Gary. So, the, the you know, there may be clashes and Jesse might say, you know, because rather than Gary being identified as the person with the problem, the child might be identified as the person with the problem, at which point it might be a time to refer that child to a clinician of their own. But also sometimes um, just normalising that, um, you know, parents, when they're stressed, they they don't do a, a good a job as they could. And um, it, it is interesting that with teenagers, I mean, they're still living at home and so it makes it hard to have a, a really deep discussion with, you know, your father has a personality disorder. I mean, I don't know that that would be really helpful. But I have engaged with teenagers where... Um, you know, just even talking about the fact that when parents are stressed, they're not doing a good enough job and how can you, how can I support you? How can I help you? What would be the most useful thing? I mean, there's headspace, there's all sorts of things, you know, liaising with the school and finding out, um, you know, whether there are supports there. And I think also with peers, um, you know, that, that teenagers might have peers that might sort of support them as well as in terms of their network. Um, and, and one of the things that sort of came up was, was Gary's loneliness, that sometimes with people like this, they will join groups um, where they feel they can, um, you know, feel that they're contributing something and that will contribute something towards their peers' support um, and, and get them out of the house so that they're not necessarily with Jesse and, and their child. But it's, it's a really complex thing, but it's actually true that it's an intergenerational trauma that continues. And I'm not clear about what to do except mop up as we go. Thanks, Monica. Now, Tom, I, I would like to bring you in because I'm sure you have some thoughts around the family here, um, his wife, his child. Have you been thinking anything uh, particular you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I'm concerned. When I read the story, I was concerned. She is increasingly scared of his rageful thoughts. Now, I imagine she's not managing to read his thoughts. She's hearing his words and um, his gestures. I, I, I think <laughs> I feel like a cranky old wowser, but I think the combination of alcohol and his feeling excluded within the family is a potentially nasty combination. I'm would think that the, perhaps 
Jesse you know, and the general practitioner working with Jesse and um, uh, uh, Jesse's uh, mental health clinician too um, may be able to help her explore um, questions of her own safety and make an assessment at the very least about her capacity to judge what's going on. I would say, as anybody who was involved with Gary, I would talk to him about safety. I'd put it front and centre uh, and say that this was an issue that I uh, feel that I can see and I've got concerns about. And, um, you know, I'm wanting to work with him uh, for him to protect himself, but also to protect his child and wife. Thanks, Tom. Now, I just didn't mention before, but um, Project AIR has got some excellent resources on their website for supporting um, family members and and even uh, uh, for parenting as well. And I know that the um, COPME, the Children of Parents with Mental Illness, has resources for um, parenting with different kinds of mental health problems. But um, do look at the resource box and the Project AIR website has got some great Things, particularly if you're someone like a, a GP and you're not spending a lot of counselling time with a patient but you want to give them good resources. I recommend that. Now, um, we're just approaching the end of our time. It goes so quickly. I'd like to invite you, Andrew, first of all, to just, um, if there's anything that you'd kind of like to say, um, to leave the audience with. Um, I mean, there's probably a couple of things I could say, but I guess... It's to persist as clinicians. When we see people with this kind of presentation, it can be pretty tempting to refer on. If we can try to persist through that initial difficulty or the ongoing emerging difficulties, uh, underneath it all, these people that have experienced a loss or trauma or pain and have developed this way of coping and adapting through their life, they need our help. And I think it's really important we try to to look inside, look to that external experience. That being said, it's crucial we're taking care of ourselves and we've got good support and supervision and you don't want too many people on your caseload like this. I think a few is good, too many, and I think it could start to weigh on us. You easily could get burnt out and I don't think that's going to be good for them or for ourselves. And I, I just want to emphasise too, I agree with the ongoing assessment around the need around suicide and I think as best we can as I've said before I think we've all been saying trying to be as upfront and clear and respectful and transparent as possible to be that consistent person in this world so at least they start to have that sense of okay I know perhaps where I can stand with this clinician. Thanks Andrew really really wise advice there. Um, I think Monica I might invite you back in is there any sort of final things that you that you wanted to say? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the same as Tom and Andrew, it's, it's that thing about maintaining a, a sense of patience and understanding that the person inside is really suffering, otherwise they wouldn't be behaving like this. Um, and that it's it's about them, it's not about me. And so, um, and, and I suppose I'm thinking of the rural and isolated um, sort of clinicians who, who are watching this webinar and wondering, you know, what support do you have? How, how do you get support for yourself? I mean, I know that, um, you know, I, I can talk to colleagues, I have supervision, but, you know, there are also things, you know, you can have um, case consultation meetings via Zoom. We run them through the Australian Society for Psychological Medicine. But it, it's about sort of having a balanced life yourself so that you can actually have the support that you need to then um, allow for the fact that they're going to push against you, they're going to push your boundaries. Um, and I, I really like, you know, what Tom said about being upfront and really clear, you know, these are the boundaries, this is what we do. If you say this, this is what's going to happen. If I hear that you're beating your wife, you know, I'm going to report this. Like it's, it's all those kinds of things that are, that are helpful and just... Um, and just being present, just, just trying to maintain the relationship, as, as Andrew was saying. Thank you, Monica. And then, Tom, um, I imagine you guessed that you would be next. Is there anything else that you'd like to um, 
stay in, in, in No, um, at, you know, uh, both the other speakers have really um, uh, talked about the things that I think are important. It's this balance between the hot issues, crisis, danger, you know, breakdown of, you know, in in uh, <clears throat> even if not a psychological breakdown, for instance, a breakdown in work would be a serious uh, difficulty for this family. So trying to pay attention to those significant active issues whilst, um, in a sense, the main thing we're trying to do is keeping the game somewhere in the system between general practitioner, specialist, other practitioners involved, we need to keep Gary or need to keep working with that part of Gary that wants to do something about his life. Uh, and that's not going to happen quickly. Thanks for that, Tom. And, um, yeah, look, I think everyone's just contributed so much tonight. And I, I was just reflecting, even for myself, like just being part of this multidisciplinary panel has helped me to see that the reason I had such a strong response to reading Gary's story is because I'm working in an emergency department and I'm seeing pointy end people all day, every day. So imagining myself as a GP with a Gary was just too much. And even just a, you know, a conversation of this length is so valuable. So I encourage everybody to make sure that you have good um, peer groups and good professional supervision if you're doing this kind of work. So I'd like to just... Uh, thank all the panellists again. Uh, it's been a really rich and interesting discussion. So thank you all very much for your individual and collective contribution. Now just to the audience, please make sure that you don't leave without completing our exit survey. So there's a, a, a feedback survey tab which you can open to complete the survey. Uh, and you will receive an attendance certificate within a couple of weeks and you will also receive an email with a link to the resources from the webinar and that will include a recording of the webinar. You may not all be aware that um, all of the MHPN webinars are in a library online and you can log in and uh, access those for free and there are many, 40 to 50, I, I know, don't know the exact numbers. But thank you so much to the audience for your participation tonight. We've had... Um, such a great number of people participating, over 1,800, which must be close to a record. Um, and hopefully the new platform has worked well for you too. So if you wanted to say anything about how you found that, please go ahead. Um, and also to once again thank Project AIR for their collaboration with MHPN on this webinar. So thank you all very much and I hope you have a pleasant evening. Good night.